Well, we are tonight going to be in the book of Matthew. Would you please turn to Matthew 18? Matthew 18. And you know, I was praying tonight about what God might have me share. And this passage of Scripture has been on my mind. I, I, to be candid, I shared it this morning at St. George also. And God has been leading me to this passage, and I think it's because he, there are things in me that he wants to change and things that he's working out in me, and maybe he wants to do that in you as well in this area. So we're going to uh, read Matthew 18 together tonight, and I'm going to read one verse, and then we're going to pray It says in Matthew 18, 1, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you, God, for your presence. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you have something to say to us tonight. And God, we kneel before you in obedience we come desiring for you to do a work in us that we would be changed in such a way that it would be sustainable by your Holy Spirit. We're not looking to just look better in front of people. We want to actually mature and grow in you and have understanding. And so we pray, God, that you would do that in our hearts and we give you permission to move in us, to shine your light in us and to change us according to your good pleasure. Challenge us, Father. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for the fact that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We thank you that you love us and that you're for us and not against us. And we thank you that you love us enough even to correct us. And this evening, God, we rest in you as we listen to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So let's read the first seven verses. It says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man for whom or by whom the offense comes. So we see this really interesting passage where, you know, um, Jesus uses a picture, a teachable moment. He uses the, 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 a child to teach the disciples a valuable lesson. But I want to look at three things before we really get into the depth of the scripture. And that is, first of all, the biblical context, then other passages that might be similar and then finally, the perspective that the passage takes. So the first thing we're going to look at is the context. You guys remember what happened in the last chapter. In the last chapter, Jesus revealed something interesting to the disciples. He said, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. Now, there were some other things that happened in that chapter, but this huge revelation to the disciples, this was not the first time they'd heard it, but it was the first time he said, I will be betrayed. Interesting, right? Because these men, for three years, have traveled with Jesus. These people travel with Jesus, they camped together, they ate together, they worshiped together, they prayed together, uh, they basically lived together. For three years, and their response to Jesus revealing that he would be betrayed, killed, and rise again, their response was, yeah, but who's the greatest? Yeah, but 
who's the greatest. I mean, let's talk about something that's really important, like me, right? And, and, and to be candid with you, that's kind of where we all are from time to time, where we begin to think that everything revolves around us. And, and I want to tell you that we, we, get, we, we really get upset with the disciples and we think, man, what a bunch of losers. Sometimes we're like, why didn't they get it? I mean, Jesus told them over and over again the truth, but they're just like right over their head. But I want you to look at our own lives. When we read God's word, when he takes us through certain things, there are many times when we just don't get it. We interpret everything he says, and the Bible, we interpret it according to what we want it to say to make our world better, what we perceive as better. In other words, many times when we read the word or pray or anything, it's really all about us. And this is the, the perspective of the disciples. Who is the greatest, right? Right? And so also, we see there are some other passages that have, uh, he, the same thing has happened in, in Mark and in Luke. The disciples asked Jesus, hey, which one of us is the greatest? Who's going to sit at your right hand? You know, one time was at communion, or was at the Last Supper. He was asked that. And I remember one of the mothers, right, of the two brothers that were disciples was like, hey, Jesus. I just want to work a little something out with you. I'd like one of my sons to sit on your right hand and the other son to sit at the left hand. Can you make that happen? I mean, she was being a good mama, right? Just trying to work stuff out for her kids. But my point is, is that we see in Scripture that this is a somewhat, this is something they've wrestled with, their position in the organization. How, how are things going to shake out? If Jesus were to become king, which is what they wanted, to be a physical king at that time, where would they be in that whole setup? Now what's really interesting about this passage of Scripture is it starts out by telling us that we must come to Jesus as we are and then be converted and become as a child. So the, there's two perspectives in this entire chapter. One is that we must, to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must become like a child. That's one message. And another message is that as we become that child, and as our pride is stripped away, and as we come to God in complete dependence upon him like a child, then we're to see other children of God as our brothers and sisters, and see them as children of God and treat them accordingly. So this passage really talks about both of those things. And so I want to look at that tonight, and I think it's going to be helpful for us, beneficial for us. So Jesus has a teachable moment. The, the disciples say, hey, who's going to be the greatest? We know you're going to die and all that. Yeah, okay, whatever. But who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus' response was to bring a child and say, okay, you see this child? A teachable moment. Sometimes I wonder what the child thought, right? The, word, the Greek word used there for child means a small child under the age of 10. What did that child think? He's just chilling, watching the rabbi, watching the rabbi and his crew doing whatever they're doing, and Jesus says, come here, takes him and uses him as a visual. So he's overhearing all that Jesus is saying. And the disciples are able to, to roll with it to a point. They hear Jesus say, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven until you are converted to be like this child. In other words, you come as you are with all your wrinkles and your faults and, and all the problems that you have, you know, pride and arrogance and whatever. You come with that to Jesus and then you're changed by the power of God. The Holy Spirit moves in your life. You're set on this path of sanctification and God begins stripping those things out of you. 
So you come as you are, and then you're converted, and you must become as a little child to inherit the kingdom of God. That's the message. In other words, it's not about our pride and arrogance and always being right. It's not about always being on top. The, the interesting thing about using a child as the example is I think of the innocence of a child. I didn't say sinlessness. I said innocence. Because the truth is that children are born with a sin nature. And they're actually very selfish when they first come out, aren't they? They can't communicate except by crying. They want to eat when they want to eat. They want to cry when they want to cry. They poop wherever they want. They throw up on you. It's all about them, their needs. The only way they have to communicate is crying. They don't mind inconveniencing mom or dad. Right? And they are self-focused because they have to be. But the truth is, is they're born with a sin nature. We never have to teach children how to lie, or how to be sneaky. We don't have to teach them that. They learn it. They, it develops in them, and that's why they need Jesus. That's why they need Jesus. But even though there is sin there, isn't it amazing how innocent a child can be? It's almost like, yeah, they have that sin nature, but there's a lack of guile in their heart. They're trying to figure things out. They accept other boys and girls. They want to play with people. They don't, they don't uh, push you away because of the way you look or the color of your skin or how much money your parents make. They just want to interact. They just want relationship. And there's a simplicity to their lives. And, and they come with this trusting dependence upon their parent or their caregiver. I mean, they, they completely have to trust. And sometimes, unfortunately, their trust is misplaced because a parent may have issues or a caregiver may have issues. But that child just trusts, believes that they're going to get fed, believes that they're going to be clothed, that they're going to be sheltered. And they, they have complete dependence upon their parent, and that's how God desires that we come to him, with complete dependence upon him, with trusting him, that our pride is stripped away, and even though we have a sin nature, he begins to work in us, and he changes us. We become more and more dependent. We start to realize we're not supposed to be independent of God. We start to realize that it's not all about us, he begins to change us. And we see this reflected in this passage. What's really interesting is that the church has kind of, and I'm not necessarily talking about our church, I'm talking about the church universal, has kind of added to this concept that when we come to the Lord, that God is getting this great deal. And we almost beg people to come to Jesus, like Jesus really needs you. He really needs you to come. You're so amazing. Bring all that you are. And if you say all the right words and do all the right stuff, you're going to get a new car or you're going to get very prosperous. You're going to, you know, you're going to be so blessed. going to bless your socks off. You know, just, you know, and, and we sell salvation like it's based on the worth of people. But in fact, salvation is all about God. It's all about his love, that he loved us first. When we were unlovely in our sin, God loved us, that Jesus came to die on a cross to forgive you of your sin. And what you bring to him is your sinful nature. What you bring to him is the fact that you are broken and need forgiveness. And even though you are talented and beautiful and you have all of these gifts, which by the way came from God, none of those things can save you. Only faith in Jesus Christ, only a relationship with him can save you. Everything else, it tells us in Isaiah 64, that our righteousness is like filthy rags in comparison to the righteousness of God. So unfortunately, the church is almost given this crazy idea of what salvation is, but really salvation is about repentance. It's about being humble. It's about being broken before the Lord. We come to Jesus, we are converted, and then become dependent upon him, a childlike faith. 
And what's interesting about that passage, it says the, the tense is to be continually humble before the Lord. It doesn't just happen once when you're saved and then you can just be all prideful, don't worry about it. The idea is that we are continually humble before the Lord. Continually humble towards Him and towards others. And we're going to talk more about humility, but I, I want you to know that what I've heard said is that humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less often. In other words, it's not saying how terrible you are. It is instead saying, I'm not going to concentrate on myself and my needs all the time. I'm going to follow the scripture that says to esteem others higher than myself. It's a choice. You know, uh, sometimes we don't feel like being humble. We don't feel like it. And yet, like so many things in the Christian life, it's a discipline where you choose to esteem someone higher than yourself and you pray to God that your feelings will come into alignment. We pray and we wage war against the sin of pride in our lives, against that need to constantly lift ourselves up above others. We wage war against that sin of always thinking we have to be on the top. You know, um, I, I think personality factors in to the desire to live a humble life. If you have strong leadership skills, a lot of times it's very difficult for you to see yourself being in that humble role and esteeming others. And I don't think it's always because you want to be prideful. I just think that you find yourself so often in front. You find yourself so often leading the fray, so to speak, that it's hard for you to step back. But I want you to, to remember that Jesus is the epitome of a leader. And how did he do it? He was a servant leader in that he chose to give his very life he chose to be the servant of all. And if you really have the spiritual gift of leadership, then what we should be praying for is also that heart of service. Not that we're going to be number one. Not that people are going to be so impressed by who we are and how we are. So it says in here, he who humbles himself is the greatest in the kingdom. And it says, he who receives one of God's children in this manner receives Christ. Now here's where the perspective begins to change. At first we're told, unless you're converted and become like a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So that's for all of us. And then it starts saying, and the way that we treat others matters. And it says, if we treat others like they are God's children, then it's as though we received them and we're receiving Christ. It makes me think of the passages of Scripture that talk about, uh, you know, the, the naked person comes to the door that needs clothing, or the hungry person comes to the door that needs food, and, and, and the conviction came from the Lord, right? You Somebody, I came to your door and you did not clothe me. Or I came to the door and you did not feed me. Christ, when did you come to the door? And he says, uh, if, I've done, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. There's this concept in the kingdom of God that as we serve the body of Christ, as we reach out to people, as we love people, it's as though we are loving Christ. And we see that here, that if we love our brothers and sisters, it's as though we are loving Christ. To receive means to accept, to embrace, to bend towards, to link our hearts with. And I want you to think about people coming to know the Lord, new people coming into the fellowship. How are they received? How are they treated? Do you think your job is to fix them and to get them to look just like you and act just like you? God forbid. Don't do that. You're not the spiritual police. That is not your job. You know what our job is? To love them. Our job is to pray for them. Our job is to come alongside them. Our job is to help them in, in, in all the ways that we can, to embrace them, to lean down towards them. I have eight grandchildren, 
and they're all a blessing. And I'm thinking of one particular grandchild who speaks so softly to me. that I do a lot of this. Tell people. Tell people what you think. Tell people what's on your mind. What do you want? Where can we go? What can I get you to eat? Talk to people. And in a way, I, I feel like we are that way. We should be that way with people who are entering the kingdom of God, the people that come here, to bend towards them, to embrace them, to link hearts with them, not to judge them or to sit in judgment over them. So we see this change of perspective in the passage, and, and there are seven different things that I see about how we are to relate to one another, and I'm going to try to get through them quickly, and I may have to skip some of it, but you guys bear with me, okay? The first thing is don't tempt or stumble each other. Jesus says it's better if a millstone is tied around your neck and you're thrown into the sea. Can you imagine the disciples and how they felt at that moment? I mean, one second, Jesus is just talking about this child, becoming like this child. The next minute, what? We're falling off the boat into the sea? What's happening? What's going on here? And Jesus wanted to get their attention. What was he saying? He was saying, this is serious. This is serious. And you know, so often this passage is used to talk about how adults should minister to children. And you can apply it that way. That's great. Make that application. But that is not what it's talking about contextually. In context, it is still talking about those who have come to know Jesus Christ and how we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to come to God and then be converted as children totally dependent upon him, and then we are to treat the rest of his children and receive them like we receive Christ. That's what this is talking about. It's, it's still talking about the way that we relate to one another. So the first thing it's saying is, don't cause your brother to stumble or your sister. That it's better for you to have died than to live a life of causing people to stumble and to turn away from God. This is heavy, man. This is heavy because we live in a day where people can come to church and act like everything's fine. Man, I'm beautiful. I'm all dressed up. I'm this, I'm that, you know. I look shiny today. And then we think we can go off and live our lives any way we want, but the Bible says, no, there's supposed to be a conversion that happens. There's supposed to be a transformation. And if we want to make modern day application to this, I think of all kinds of ways that we can cause a young believer or a believer to stumble. I think of telling dirty jokes I think of people who come to church just to hook up. Who get with a brother or sister, have sex, walk away from them, that they feel shattered and betrayed. I think about how we talk about one another. And as you're talking to someone about somebody else, they're thinking, what do they say about me? I thought this person was different. I thought this place was different. I thought we were supposed to love one another. I think about the husband who uses God's word to beat his wife emotionally when really he's just an arrogant jerk. I think about the person who brings all kinds of ne negativity into a conversation and so weighs down the other person that they feel discouraged and they just want to walk away. I'm thinking about kids who see their parents come to church and act very spiritual, but then they go into a rage in the car on the way home or a rage at home and they're cussing and yelling and screaming and the kid has a disdain now for Christianity. And they think, if that's what it's about, forget it. 
I think about people that have become so bitter and so resentful because of unforgiveness in their heart that they feel like they have to gossip and poison everybody. Not knowing how they've affected somebody's faith in God or their walk with God. There are so many ways that we can possibly cause people to stumble that goes way beyond what we think, you know, like we think, man, if a pastor has an affair or something like that, he's going to destroy people and destroy his church, and that is certainly true. And the danger there is that there's a lot of people involved and a lot of visibility, and so there's a, a potential for huge impact But what I'm talking about is what about us sitting in the chairs dealing with one person at a time or small groups of people? What kind of impact are we having? Are we speaking life and bringing life? Or do we seriously have some issues in our heart that we need to surrender to God and ask for forgiveness for? I bet some of you out there tonight are shocked because you realize that one time you walked with God with purity of heart and mind and you used to come to church and be excited to be in church and excited to read the word and excited to pray, excited for worship, but something has gone on and now you look at people and you avoid them. You try to sit at different places and something's changed inside of you. You're like, how did I get from there to here? How did that happen to me? How we respond is important. How we think is important. How we talk. How we truly see one another. And this can be a real battle for us at times. It's not always easy. It's not easy to wage war against those thoughts. What are we going to do? The Bible says this passage says the fences will happen. But woe to you if you're the one that causes them to happen. I don't want to be the one that causes them to happen. I don't want to be that guy that causes people to walk away or to become bitter or to become hurt. I don't want to take all the garbage in, that I deal with sometimes and go home and dump all that garbage on my wife and have her resenting ministry. I don't want that. So what am I supposed to do when those things happen? When I'm feeling that way, when that rises up in me, what do I do with it? And here's what I am trying to do. I want to tell you that I have not perfected this. But what I do is I take it to the cross. And I I get face first. And I cry out and I tell God all of the stuff he already knows is there. Everything I can think of, the stuff that's bothering me, the stuff I'm worried about, the stuff I'm concerned about, the stuff that ticked me off that somebody did or said. I take it to the Lord. And you know what? And I would like to say that every time I get up that I feel cleansed and good, but sometimes that's not true. Sometimes I get up and it's still there and, I, and I'm so tempted to, to tell people I'm so tempted to share it, and I have to ask myself, why? Why do you want to share it? And there are times when I do need a person with skin on to listen to me. There are times when I need a counselor, and I need to sit with somebody who's mature in the Lord, and this is what I say to them. I have a bunch of feelings, a bunch of garbage. Excuse the word, sometimes I say I have a bunch of crap in me, and and I don't know what to do with it. I've prayed about it, but I still have heartburn. And I need to talk to somebody, and I need them to tell me the truth. And I have one, an individual that I can go to, to do that. And, And he knows this. He knows that he can tell me the truth and shoot straight with me. He can mourn with me, or he can kick my rear. And then we pray together, and it's done. I can't go to multiple people. I can't go to three other people or five other people to get prayer under the guise of, you know, oh, brother, just pray with me. Oh, sister, would you pray about this? This person said this, and it really hurt my feelings. No. 
I don't want to stir that stuff up. Well, sometimes I do want to stir it up. But I'm not going to stir that stuff up. You guys with me? I'm being super honest with you and super open about this, but I want to tell you right now, the Bible tells us how we are to respond, and this passage gets into it. Number two, don't cause division. There are so many scriptures about this. I'm just going to read a couple. Romans 16, 17 through 18 says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. There's a type of person that just has this heartburn and they just want to share it. And they want to get as many people as possible on their side. You've heard the saying, misery loves company. We want to make other people miserable. Think about that in this context. As you are sharing information with other people, other believers... What is happening to their spiritual walk? What's your motivation? Titus 3.10 says, As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. We're not supposed to spread rumors and bad feelings. The Bible says to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind and to love others as ourselves and I think of it as vertically love God, horizontally love people, and we have a cross, right? Pastor Derek is the one who taught me this. God and people. If you don't have both, you just have a stick. <laughs> you just have a stick. Number three, don't think of yourself as spiritually superior. If we have a bent in our personality towards legalism, this could be us. That we begin to think of ourselves as spiritually mature or spiritually superior and more mature than everybody else. You know, I don't drink or chew or go with girls who do, right? Um, And we think, we get this idea that we're just, we're, we're super spiritual, And the truth is, is you probably didn't start out that way. You started out that way just wanting to honor God. You were walking in the Spirit. You were walking in the Spirit and you were enjoying some victory in your life over sin. And before long, something happened where your perspective changed and you started thinking it was about you and how great you were doing. And now you look at everybody else and wonder why they're so weak in a certain area. And you're feeling spiritually superior And I want to tell you the Bible warns against that pharisaical attitude. The truth is, is we don't have to tell people who are smoking in the parking lot that smoking is bad for their health. They know it. They don't need the spiritual police to come and write them a ticket. You don't need to go and correct people for what they're wearing. You don't need to do that. If you're really concerned about them, how about you pray for them? Hit your knees. Pray for them. Let your spirituality be between you and the Lord. And then love them hard. Love them. Enjoy them. Let God begin to change them. And yes, there are times when correction happens, but I want to tell you that it doesn't have to be with a bunch of people running around trying to be the spiritual police. That pushes people away from God. You're not helping. There's a passage of scripture in Luke 18. It says, Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. 
I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. It's really not our job to look for people to fix. Remember the scripture that talks about the speck in our brother's eye and we have a plank in our own eye. We have, you know, one translation calls it a pole and I think of like a telephone pole sticking out of my head. You know, and I'm trying to get a speck out of my wife's eye and tell her how she's wrong about something. Meanwhile, I'm like knocking stuff off the walls with the pole in my, sticking out of my head. It's a silly example, but sometimes it's like that for us. We don't have to be the Holy Spirit. He can handle the purification of the body. We are told to respond to people in a godly manner and in love. We come to God with that childlike faith, and then we protect the other children of God, our brothers and sisters in Christ. The idea is to to bless them. And again, there are times when correction is necessary. But so often we have this thing where we try to push ourselves to the top. We push ourselves forward and up because we feel like we need to be on the top and that's our human nature. And I think of two beautiful quotes. One is by a missionary in the 1800s. Robert Morrison said, the great fault, I think, in our mission is that no one likes to be second. That's what he said in 1800. And I think now, in 2021, it's even more true that people don't want to follow. They really don't want to be told what to do. They, they don't even like the idea of being dependent on God, really, many times, because they think that our American values should outweigh our biblical values, and we get to call the shots. The truth is, is that God calls the shots. Here's a, another quote by Leonard Bernstein, who is, uh, you guys know who he is. He uh, worked with the New York Philharmonic. He said, the second fiddle. I can get plenty of first violinists, but to find someone who can play the second fiddle with enthusiasm, that's a problem. And if we have no second fiddle, we have no harmony. What was he saying? He was talking about the fact that every part was important and adds beauty. The Bible says it this way, that we're all different parts of the same body and we all have a function and we function together and we don't all want to be one part of the body. We're going to be the part that God has designed us to be and play the part he's designed us to play. Romans 12.10 says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor giving preference to one another. That, that's beautiful. Now, only God could do this. Only God could take a bunch of individuals, save them. They're all, uh, they, they have different backgrounds and different skin colors and different gifts, and they come from different places, and, and God brings them all together, and he makes a beautiful mosaic. And this mosaic has different colors and shapes and textures, and has created a beautiful picture a beautiful piece of art. Only God could do that in the body of Christ, and that's what he's done here. That's what he's done around the world. And we display his glory as a united body of Christ, choosing to walk in love towards one another for the glory of God, having disdain for disharmony and dissension. We don't want that. We reject it instead. We want to be united in purpose and vision, united under Christ, 
The Bible says this is how all men will know that that we belong to Jesus if we have love for one another. That's the goal. That's who he's called us to be. Only God could pull that off. If I were the one doing it, I would have had everybody be little robots and act just right and say all the right thing and do all the right things. But God's like, no, I'm going to create something more spectacular, more beautiful, more precious, which is a group of people that have laid down their own will to follow God's will. Number four, repent from our pride. Right? It, it talks about this in Matthew 18, going back to that, that passage. I'm going to read this quickly, verse 8 and 9. It says, If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. He's not saying you guys should go out and cut yourself and hurt yourself and mutilate your bodies. That's not what he's saying. What was he saying to them? He was like, are you paying attention? Cut the sin off. Be abrupt. That's what Jesus is saying. He's not saying go out and fast for 30 days. Go on a, a lemon water and cayenne pepper fast and pray about it. He's not saying that. What he's saying is cut it off. It offends me. It's sin. This division and this pride is wrong. Do what it takes to get rid of it. That's what he's saying. It is so graphic. It is so um, repulsive to think about somebody hacking off their hand or plucking out their eye, but Jesus was making a point to his disciples. Repent from your pride. Number five, search and rescue. I love this part of Matthew 18, verses 10 through 14. We, we often think of this passage as, as meaning salvation for people who are lost spiritually coming to know Jesus. And it certainly can be applied that way. It's beautiful. But contextually, it's still the same thought. He is telling a story here. He is saying, my children should not be hurt and leaving the fold. Jesus says, I'm going to make sure the 90 and 9 are safe. And then I'm going to go after that lost one as the shepherd. Look at, look at this. In verse 10, it says, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who's in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish." And again, he's not talking about those who are lost, uh, who've never known him. He's also not talking about little children, although you can apply it to that. He's talking contextually about people that have known him, that have had relationship with him, but that have walked away. That's what he's talking about. That he cares about them. But I want you to know that in the body of Christ today, the church has become very corporate. And we've heard things like, you know, if somebody walks away, the organization is better without them. Be careful. That's not the way Jesus sees it. Jesus wants his children to stay in the fold. Jesus wants his children to continue to worship him. The church isn't better off without those hurt people. Our heart should be to reach out to people that are hurting, to reach out to those who have been offended, and he tells us how, coming up. And the thing is, though, we may reach out to them and they will not reconcile. It's possible. 
And man, it takes time and it takes energy and it takes, oh my goodness, it can be so discouraging at times. And yet, it's still here in Scripture. It's still here that we would reach out to those who are hurting and that we would try to restore and reconcile relationship. And if they choose not to, then that's on them. But the thing is, what about our heart? What about, are we going to do what it says in God's word? We're not to flippantly let hurting people go. We're to search and rescue when possible. Because that's the heart of God. Number six, deal with conflict with reconciliation as the goal. Deal with conflict with reconciliation as the goal. And I'm not going to read this passage. I, I, I want to ask you guys to please read the rest of the chapter, but, but I ran out of time. But I am going to go over the points from this passage. You guys have read this. It talks about if, if your brother sins against you, this is what you're to do. The first thing it tells us is to go to him or her privately and discuss the offense. And then remember, the idea is to reconcile, to bring repentance and reconciliation. Well, if it doesn't work, then it tells us to take two or three with us and talk to them again. And then it says, if that doesn't work, then we are to take, or take it before the church, our church leadership, and deal with it that way. And then it says, if that doesn't work, if they still will not repent, if reconciliation still cannot be, it says that we're to break fellowship with that person. And we don't like to, we don't like to, to think about that today in the church because it just seems so corrective. And we don't like that. We want to sing songs and and be together, but we don't want to have to deal with any of the hard stuff, but it's right there in God's Word. So I want to ask you a question. Are you going to rip that page out? Are you going to rip that part of your Bible out? What else are you going to rip out of it tonight? Because what it says there is that we're not to just let people go, but instead we're supposed to pursue them, and then there's a way to handle it that we go privately, then we take a small group with us, then we take it before the church, all with the idea that we will have repentance and reconciliation. That's the goal. And if that will not happen, then we break fellowship with the idea that they will come back. I think of the story in 1 Corinthians you guys remember this, right? There was a guy who was sexually out of line. The whole church knew about it. And Paul said, look, you got to go to this guy. you got to deal with it. And if he's not going to stop, you need to get him out of, uh, out of the local church because he's causing a problem. And it says you're supposed to put him out so that for the destruction of his flesh. And they did. And then in 2 Corinthians, he addresses that same issue again. And he says, that brother is repentant. He, he is, he's repented. Go and bring him in again. The idea was that we don't discipline for the sake of never having anything to do with people, that when correction comes, it's to bring reconciliation. Ultimately, that is the goal. And it goes on to say that unity or disunity affects our prayers. You guys read that passage yourself. It talks about being in agreement and praying in agreement touches the heart of God and brings results in our prayers. And then finally, the very last section talks about forgiveness. That forgiveness should be a hallmark of our lives. That's the last 10, 11 verses. And you know, Peter asked Jesus, a question with a loophole. He was looking for a loophole. It's like, Jesus, how many times should we forgive our, our brother? Seven times? Pete, Pete, Pete. And Jesus basically responds to him as many times as it takes. As many times as it takes. Keep forgiving your brother and sister. 
as many times as it takes. That's the hallmark of the Christian life. The same forgiveness and mercy that has been poured out in your life, we pour out in the lives of others. That doesn't mean that we make unwise decisions. For giving people, there still need to be very often parameters in place, walls in place, depending on what's going on in their lives. But forgiveness should be something that, that we do as believers. In fact, it goes on to say that there's discipline in store for Christians who will not forgive. If you read that parable, you will see that there's a corrective measure for, for Christians who try to live their lives without a heart of forgiveness. A strong man. That's a strong word for us tonight. Jesus said, you know what? You come to me, I will make you like little children where you're dependent upon me, you love me, you have that simplistic faith in me, and then I'm going to cause you to love your brothers and sisters in, in the same way, and it's just like loving me. And then he tells us how to do it, and he tells us how to love, and he tells us how to deal with conflict and he tells us that he wants us to be reconciled and he wants us to forgive and then as it goes into the next chapter it takes that concept of forgiveness into marriage I'm not going to go there tonight I'm not going to meddle but read it without the chapter breaks so the question for us tonight is as a believer are you walking with that kind of purity in your relationships towards one another? Or do you feel this burden of, of bitterness or negativity or something that is just kind of consuming you and you've been dealing with it, you've been trying to deal with it, but it's affecting those relationships. It's affecting the way you function. You don't like that anymore. You want to have that purity of heart. I believe that God's best for us is to pursue that, to pray for that, to have that pure heart towards one another, to show the world that we love one another and that we belong to Jesus, that we've created a beautiful piece of art that only God can do. And that as those things arise that challenge that, that we take those thoughts captive and we take them to the cross. And if we need to talk to somebody, we find a counselor that is trustworthy, that's a believer, that will tell us the truth and hold us accountable. Otherwise, you know what we're going to become? We're going to become a bitter Christian who acts differently around different people. Somebody who's not truly true to who they profess to be because our heart is divided. I don't want to be that way. This passage of Scripture has been so convicting for me as I've been studying it. I want God to soften my heart. I want him to clean out the gunk that is there from bitterness or resentment or pride or whatever. And with everything that is within me and in all ways possible, I want to walk in peace. How about you guys? Do you want to do that too? Can we pray together? Would you bow your heads and, and close your eyes? The first thing that I want to say is if you're here tonight and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, this is a perfect opportunity. Because as you can see from this passage of Scripture, Jesus deeply loves and cares for his children. And he wants you to be his child. If you have never put your, your trust and faith in Jesus, I would love to pray with you right now. So I'm going to ask you, if that's you, 
to just lift your hand up. Let me see your hand. Is there anybody here who says, Pastor Jim, I want to receive Jesus. I want to know him. I see your hand. I want my sins forgiven. I see your hand. Let me pray with you right now. Father, I thank you for these that have raised their hands. Oh God, you're so faithful and by your spirit you pull people to yourself and these people want to know you, Father, and they want to encounter you and I just thank you for that and I pray, God, that you would indeed transform their lives tonight. With your head still bowed, I want to talk to the believers. If you find yourself in a place where you know that your relationships with others have been tainted by the world in some way, if there's something that you need to give up, if, if your passion for Christ and your love for others has just become an ember that's dying away and you desire the Spirit of God to blow His breath upon that and, and bring it to flames again, would you do me a favor and lift up your hand? Would you lift up? I see your hands. Is there anybody else? I see your hands. Thank you. I see your hands. Anybody else? I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands. Let me pray with you. Father, I thank you for these that have raised their hands. I thank you, God, for their boldness in the Holy Spirit, their desire to surrender once again, to be continually humbled. to walk in that, to let go of unforgiveness, to let go of maybe some negativity and bitterness or resentment. God, I pray that supernaturally you would do a work in each heart, that you will remove for them the, the, the cancer of, of that and, and how it has damaged their daily walk with you, Father. I pray that you'd remove it and that you would heal them. I pray for a freshness, God, to come upon them, to come in them. Your word says to be continually filled with your Holy Spirit. And I pray for a continual feeling, a filling for each one, God. I pray that they would sense your presence, that they would have a new desire for your word, for prayer. I pray, God, that words of of life from your word will flow from their lips. I pray, God, that when they look at other people, that the same mercy that they've received from you would be poured out to them, through them. God, I pray that they would have a newfound love for those that have become extremely tiresome and annoying to them. And I pray, Father, that this isn't just a feeling that happens tonight, but it's something sustainable by your Holy Spirit. That you would empower each of them to make the choices daily they need to make to walk in your ways. Oh God, you are good and you love us. Your mercy endures forever. We thank you, Father. We praise you, Lord. Change all of us, God, according to your good pleasure. In Jesus' name, amen.